It says that in the case of a national emergency, the government can essentially repossess or commandeer this plane in order to, to assist with whatever the emergency is. So going back 20 years now, thought this was, wow, this is, this is new because normally when you hijack a plane, you go from A to B. Are hijacking for money. They're trying to extort airlines. Uh, they're trying to extort governments uh, for financial concessions. Do you remember airplane hijackings way back in the 1960s and 1970s? What the hell was that all about? And what link does it have to terrorism? Hi, this is Phil Gursky, President and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting in Russell, Ontario, Canada. And you're listening to Canadian Intelligence, eh? It's interesting that when we talk about airline hijackings, that for most of us, this would be a historical phenomenon. One that we certainly don't have to worry as much about these days, particularly in the post 9-11 period. I'm not sure if last time you flew on an airplane, probably quite some time since COVID-19 broke out, but what a pain in the ass it is to get on an aircraft these days, which could imply that airline hijackings are in fact a thing of the past. Are they? I have secured as a guest on the podcast today, a friend of mine, Dr. Yannick Villiers-Depage, who is from Ottawa, by the way. He's an associate professor, assistant professor, pardon me, of terrorism and political violence at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And his research interests include the creation of online narratives and propaganda, which foster and normalize terrorism, as well as historical antecedents to terrorism, the far right, and transnational links, et cetera, et cetera. So Yannick, uh, thanks very much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, Phil. Let's start way back at the beginning, Yannick. What is it about terrorism that took a young man like you and decide, and you decided, hey, I want to devote my life to studying what this is all about? What was the first kind of inkling or what drew you to it in the first place? So I, I think the, the answer in many ways is not an overly original answer. Uh, being born in the 80s, like many people my age, 9-11 happened, kind of a seminal point uh, in my life. I was in high school, started thinking about what I was going to do after high school. And eventually I chose to do my, my first degree, my undergraduate in political science at, at Carleton University. And while I was there, uh, I had a chance to meet a couple of individuals that became great mentor who were studying terrorism uh, back in you know the early days after 9-11. When there wasn't a great deal, uh, of course, there wasn't a great deal uh, of specialized program on national security. So I did my degree in what was called interdisciplinary study, or how I used to like to call it, make your own adventure, uh, which essentially allowed me to <laughs> various classes from political science to religion to history. Uh, and then from then on, I, I went to Nipsia. I did a degree in conflict analysis and I ended up working for the Canadian government for several years before deciding to go back into academia and do my PhD in international relations with a focus on terrorism study at the Hanta Center for the Study of Political Violence and Terrorism, uh, which is based at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And that's essentially, you know, that, that trajectory uh, started off essentially reacting to, to what seemed like a very seminal life event uh, when I was a teenager and trying to understand where it came from and what would have motivated, you know, 19 people to fly a plane or to fly several planes into, into buildings in, in the heart of the United States and change the course of history. It's interesting to hear you say a couple of things. First of all, you're far too young. If you're born in the eighties, my God, that's what I was starting my, my career in intelligence in the eighties. So that makes, shows you how old I am. Secondly, you talked about nine 11 being a seminal event and, about a year ago or so, I actually had my daughter, who was, I think is a little younger than you. She was born in 89. And I asked her what she thought of 9-11. So she would have been 12 years old at the time. She was in elementary school. And she recalls it being, uh, a, 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 as you say, a seminal event, I think, for her generation. And she recalls me being not home very much those days. I was at CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service at the time. And not surprisingly, I was uh, rather busy in the aftermath of 9-11. You also, I think, made a valid point, Yannick, and that's about how you know, around the time of 9-11, and I've talked about this quite a bit, there really wasn't a robust terrorism scholarship 
initiative worldwide. I mean, terrorism was kind of, as you said, a sidebar. You called it make your own adventure. And certainly, I think in the post 9-11 period, we've seen this explosion of interest uh, on all levels of society, including in academic uh, studies, looking at terrorism as a phenomenon. So congratulations to you for for grabbing that ring. I think it's, it's great to have your contributions in the field. Uh, more specifically, okay, yeah, 9-11 was seminal. It truly it really did change the world in terms of how we look at a variety of things. Why is it in 2020, so 20 years later, you decided to look at airline hijackings, which most people would say um, those don't take place anymore. So why is this academic looking at airline hijackings? What was it about those that you thought needed more attention? So I think it's important to kind of backtrack a little bit here. My main motivation in writing this book wasn't to look at airline jack hijacking uh, as a whole, but rather to try to understand how is it that the new techniques of, of political violence of terrorism kind of come about? How do they spread and and why do some groups employ them and other groups don't employ them? And and I spent a considerable amount of time trying to think about okay, what is a technique which has a long enough history and that has been adopted in various contexts. Uh, that would allow that would be essentially rich enough of a history in order for for me to really study this phenomenon of of terrorist tactical innovation and hijacking really fit the bill. It's got a, a very long history. It's been used by by uh, jihad Salafist group. It's been used by various ethno nationalist group. It's been used. In, as early as in the 1930s, um, and it essentially changed the face of modern day aviation. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to focus on hijacking. The other reason as well was that when I started looking at this topic, I, I, I encountered a few individuals who essentially told me there's nothing else that can be done on hijacking. It's been done to death. You know, people wrote the books on, on this topic in the 70s and the 80s. And there's much more current uh, form of terrorist techniques that, that warrant our investigation. And what I want to do with my framework is I want to see whether using evolutionary theory will allow us to understand a phenomenon that supposedly had been done to death and draw new insights into it. So for me, airplane hijacking fit the bill perfectly uh, for, for such a long, uh, a long study. The other thing as well with airline hijacking that I, I realized as I was doing this work is that we've only really only scratched the surface of how big this phenomenon was historically. So as I'm sure you know, and some of your, your, your listeners will know, uh, START uh, at the University of Maryland has this fantastic database of terrorist incident. It's called the GDT, the Global Terrorism right. Database. And in it, there's about 250 cases of airline hijacking that they have they have recorded. Now, in my investigation, I found over 1,080 cases of airline hijacking. So as scholars are thinking about this case, they're only working with a fraction uh, of the events that actually occurred. So for me, it was really important to, to kind of step back and apply my framework, try to understand this this phenomenon through this kind of holistic approach, looking at every single case and trying to understand how is it that a technique that was invented in Peru in the 1930s ended up being used by Palestinians, ended up being used throughout the, the Cuban revolution, and then how did that eventually uh, climax with the, the attacks of 9-11? I'm surprised to hear you say that the GTD, so the Global Terrorism Database, which I certainly have used and many scholars have used, would have such a uh, a gap in its data set. And I think this points to a really important issue, Yannick, in that, you know, people, I think, who rely on open source information, like scholars, like journalists, like laypersons, when it comes to studying terrorism, your analysis is only as good as your data. Now, those of us who work in security intelligence, of course, had different types of data to which people like you didn't have access for obvious reasons. But if the databases that are open and freely available are incomplete, 
What does that tell us about the analysis that the terrorism analysis upon which they're based then? Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. And I think there's sometime um, a, a bit of a crutch where terrorism researchers go back to the terrorism database. Now, in order for me to construct the, the database that I used uh, for this study, it was really important to kind of step outside of this, this terrorism bubble. So I, I did archival work. I did interviews with uh, people in the field of aviation, but also in the field of insurance, uh, because insurance companies had a wealth of information on, on hijacking that happened in the 60s and the 70s. Um, I used government reports. I spent a lot of time going over you know, old newspapers. Um, so in many ways, there's still a lot of place for primary kind of historical investigation in order to build up this capacity, in order to build up our terrorism databases. Uh, you, wow. Uh, first of all, kudos to you for doing that. I must went a hell of a lot of research that you did. And I think that, you know, what it demonstrates again is that uh, if you're going to look at an issue, you, you better make, you better make sure your data is as comprehensive as it can be. And, and you and I both know, Yannick, that nothing is comprehensive. It does take a lot of work. And I think you you talked about people using the GTD as sort of a crutch, as an easy way to get at things. I, I think there's a, there's a valuable lesson, I, I think, for a lot of people on that. Now, you talk about evolutionary theory in, in a Darwinian sense, and you talk about the links between evolution and, and the social sciences. And in your book, you talk about proximate developmental and functional explanations for airline hijackings. Can you walk me through in a way that I can understand what you mean by all this? Yeah. So kind of at the onset, I, I think it's important to do just a bit of a uh, bit of history about kind of how Darwin was thinking and what Darwinian evolution actually means. Now, when we think of Darwinian evolution, we generally think about biology. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a way that we understand how um, how evolution or how change in this very complex system, which is, you know, life has occurred. But if you strip it down mm -hmm. to its basis assumption, Darwinian evolution is about three mechanisms. First of all, there's a form of, var of, of variation or if innovation, right? Not everything is the same. Change right. happen in the system. Right. Secondly, there's a form of transmission. So once these variations have happened, there's a mechanism in which these transmissions are passed on to the next generation. And lastly, there's a mechanism of selection. There's a mechanism that will essentially select on these variations and kind of reward variations that are seen as beneficials and window out or like punish variations which are seen uh, as harmful for for you know an organism or, or whatnot now i essentially yeah, i get that that's the way i understand evolution yeah okay so that's essentially my starting point here i was interested in three questions how do new techniques emerge or adapt so that goes back to the question of variation how are techniques spread or how do techniques spread? So how is it that a technique like, for example, suicide bombing would emerge in, uh, in the Middle East? How was it spread to Sri Lanka where it was later adopted by, you know, the LTT, for example? And the last, right, right. What explains the adoption of a new technique? Why is it that some groups, for example, the LTT will have adopted suicide bombing while other groups like the PIRA will not have adopted suicide right. bombing. So those were essentially right. the great, three, great question. Yeah. So those were essentially the three kind of guiding principle of my research, and that's essentially what I set out to what I set out to examine. So in every strain of hijacking that I've uh, I looked at, I essentially asked myself these three questions. So what are the variations? What is new? What is the innovation that we see. How is that innovation spread? How does it kind of, how does it get transported to another conflict? And lastly, why is it that some groups adopt this new variation? Why is it that others kind of uh, etch it, decide not to adopt it? So that's where the evolutionary framework comes in. Now, as far as the, the type of explanation I think this allows us, well, the first one 
when I'm talking about a, a proximate explanation, I'm essentially just asking what are the characteristics of a technique, right? What does this particular version of hijacking look looks like and what's its purpose? When we're looking at the more like developmental explanation, I'm essentially wondering how is it that it came to be? Uh, how, how is it sustained? And, and this is where kind of my, my wider methodology from the book comes from. And lastly, the functional questions is, is the overarching question here is how and why did a given you know, terrorist techniques spread? Why does it endure? And why is it sometimes that these techniques just disappear altogether? And those are those to me are are the questions that that keep me up at night, whether I'm thinking about airplane <laughs> hijacking, or I'm thinking about vehicle ramming, uh, or I'm thinking about mm. suicide bombing. This is really quite fascinating. Now that you've explained it that way, uh, is anybody else looking at terrorism through this lens, Yannick? Well, this is a framework that I've developed uh, for my book. Uh, it, it's based on a very long tradition of social movement theory. Uh, it's also based on a lot of the insights that we know about terrorism today. But what I think the 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 contribution that I've done here is that while we have, you know, we, we have an understanding, for example, of how terrorist techniques spread, we have some understanding of how new ideas and innovations come about. But what I've tried to do in, in my book and with my framework is take these three elements and put them together using the insights that we know uh, from the field in order to have something that's very comprehensive, in order to be able to, to look at a phenomenon from the beginning to the end. Wow. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the more I hear you talk about this, the more I'm, I'm really intrigued. Now, let's, let's get down to specifics here. You've already made some allusions here to the fact that you chose to start your look at airline or aircraft hijackings, rather, uh, in Peru in the 1930s. And if memory serves me correct, that's just about when commercial airlines began around the world, which <laughs> leads to the interesting comment that just as soon as you've got people on a plane going from A to B, you got a guy saying, take this plane to Cuba. Uh, you, uh, when you looked at, I'm curious why you started with Peru in the 1930s and what you found about you know that particular time frame. Because I'll tell you, I, I don't know squat about Peru in the 1930s. And of course, you went on to the classic, you know, the Cubans, the Palestinians. These are things people make jokes about, you know, fly this plane to Cuba. With an interesting sidebar, I found into those that hijacked planes that were uh, originally from Cuba and the USSR to get the hell out of those two countries. So why? what was it about Peru in the 1930s? You talk about the evolution of a technique. So, of course, if the technique began way back then in, in the 1930s in, a, in the, you know, the, on the west coast of, of South America, what did you learn about hijackings in Peru in that time period, which kind of got the ball rolling in terms of your research? All right. So kind of going back to that first question, right? Like how do new techniques come about? I, I essentially identify three potential source for what we call terrorist innovations for, you know, terrorists having new ideas. Now, the first one is new technology. And this is kind of like the duh, uh, explanation, right? Somebody invents dynamite. Somebody says, oh, how can I use this, you know, this new invention in order to blow up something? But there's two other, right. uh, there's two other kind of source of terrorist innovation. The first, or the, the other one is hobbyists and criminal. So essentially terrorists seem to take ideas from what criminals are doing and what hobbyists are doing. And, you know, we can see this, for example, with drones, right? So, you know, uh, ISIS has weaponized drones. They've used them in combat. Uh, but this isn't a new thing. Like criminals have been using drones to bring in, you know, drugs, weapons, phones into prison for over twenty years. So I essentially kind of absolutely. Make, uh, so I make an argument that that money is always a much better uh, incentive for innovation than ideology. So often terrorists they don't come up with the idea themselves. They look at what criminals are doing. But the other source here is the state itself. And this is probably the most contentious claim that I make. I essentially say that terrorists often try to mimic the state use of violence. And this is where Peru kind of comes in. And this is what makes Peru, I think, so interesting. 
So in 1930s, there's a revolution that's happening in Peru. And the majority of the planes in Peru are owned by an American company. And they're essentially de- they're essentially mail planes. They're delivering mails throughout throughout uh, the country. And as part as the contract that this American company has to operate in Peru, it says that in the case of a national emergency, the government can essentially repossess or commandeer these plane in order to to assist with whatever the emergency is. So when this revolution starts, the government is essentially forcing these Pan Am pilots to fly over rebel held territory and drop leaflets and you know small bombs on the rebels now after this happens essentially one of the first time this happened the rebels start taking over airfields and they wait for the planes to land and once the plane land they at first the first time it happens they take the, the pilot, and they, they essentially court-martial him, and, and there's a whole story about that. But soon after, they realize, rather than just arresting the, the pilot that has just done this propaganda drop on, on us, why don't we force him to do the same on the, on the government-held territory? So right off the bat, the first cases of hijacking that we see is essentially Peruvian revolutionaries commandeering planes in order to mimic the exact same technique that the government is using in its counterinsurgency campaign, which is to fly over, reb- uh, fly over loyalist territory and draw propaganda urging uh, the <laughs> surrender. And then the, 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 what I think is the most fascinating is the rebels are, are eventually uh, successful. And then there's a counter-revolution and during the counter-revolution, the new rebel, who are loyal to the old government, also start engaging in, in hijacking, having seen how powerful it is uh, as a mean uh, of propaganda, having seen how powerful it can be uh, as a tool uh, of insurgency. So that's the, the early cases that we see in the 1930s. Well, that's so cool. I, a, I didn't know there was a revolution in Peru in the 1930s. I guess it just shows my ignorance about 20th century Latin American history. And I took a course on it, damn it, at Western, University of Western Ontario, way back in the 1980s. So I must have forgotten that class. Um, wow, uh, that that's that's a really interesting story. M- moving on, Yannick, you, you talk about 9-11, you know, this seminal event where people chose to fly planes into buildings. And most people at the time, they're going back 20 years now, thought this was, wow, this is this is new. Because normally, when you hijack a plane, you go from A to B. Uh, you have a purpose in mind, be it propaganda, be it hostages, be it uh, ransom, whatever kind of thing. But the last thing we thought was that people would actually fly the planes into a building, ergo killing themselves and the other passengers. You argue it was not a novel technique. What do you mean by that? So as part of this, this project, um one of the one of the things that's kind of important if you're doing this kind of evolutionary um, approach is that once you identify a new a new variation a new form of a particular technique is you then need to go and ask yourself is this really the first instance of this occurring or do we see antecedents to this and so far I found 21 cases of either uh, concrete plots to fly planes into buildings or of individuals attempting to do so. Now, we've got several events. We've got a couple of events that occurred uh, in the United States in, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, two of them targeted the White House. We have another event which occurred in 1972 where uh, uh, three, three individuals, uh, three criminals who were on the run essentially hijack a plane and fly it over the Oak Ridge uh, nuclear um, lab or nuclear Mm. facility and threaten to crash the plane into it unless their demand are, unless their demand are are satisfied. And one of the things that's, I think kind of an interesting side note is uh, in the transcript of these conversation, one of the hijacker uh, 
and these are not individually minded individuals, right? Like they're doing this for money. Uh, one of the hijackers threatens that this is going to, to be much worse than Munich. And he's obviously making a reference uh-huh. to the Munich Olympic uh, massacre. That- 1972. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we do see several of these events occurring. I think the most important one, however, is uh, the 1994 Air France hijacking uh, right. and where, where the plane was, was hijacked from Algeria and brought to Marseille. And essentially there was a, the two, to our best knowledge, intelligence uh, agencies seem to believe that the plot was to, to crash the plane uh, in historic sites over Paris. Um, and one of the, I do recall that plot. Yeah. 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 But one of the things that I find quite interesting here is that while this particular plot was, was unsuccessful, it served, I believe, as a learning opportunity for Al Qaeda. It showed several of the potential pitfalls of, of trying such a plan. So in the 1994 hijacking, none of the hijackers could pilot a plane. And the I I, I really think this is one of the big flaws of, of that original plan. And we know that Al-Qaeda worked extremely hard uh, in order to get their hijackers, some of their hijackers flight training. They also exposed themselves while trying to, to do so. So this was a very risky uh, endeavor, but it was, a, it, it was seen as a crucial one uh, for the success of the 9-11 operation. And, and I reckon part of this has to do with the fact that they, they quickly realized that there isn't a lot of threat that you can exercise on a pilot to, to purposefully crash his plane in, in a building or even right. to, to take off. Uh, from from the tarmac, if he believes that that it, you know it's going to be a final flight, uh, as was the case in right, 1994. Right. So even when, and, and I think this is kind of one of the things of this approach, which is quite important, is that I don't only look at the successful cases. I don't only look at examples of hijacking that have been particularly uh, noteworthy, because often the learning experience come from those failed plots. They come from those plots that are disrupted. Um, and if you only focus on the, you know, the events that do a big bang, you're missing out a lot. Because terrorists are looking at their failures and are learning from the failures of, of their group, but also of other groups. I, I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, uh, the, the uh, my latest book, which is basically finished, uh, looking at, at terrorism in Canada uh, since Confederation, since the you know mid nineteenth century, doesn't focus solely on the successful attacks, but the foiled ones. Either either they foiled because I we stopped them, CSIS and the RCMP, or the terrorists are too stupid to organize a piss up in a bar. Do you have any concrete evidence, Yannick, that the AQ guys, the Al Qaeda guys, actually looked at? the uh, hijacking plot from 94 and specifically learn from it? Or is this speculation on your part? So it, it, it's largely speculation. One of the issues that we have with this type of, of research is access, as always. It is hard to, to sit down with an individual and ask him, you know, where did you get this particular idea? Now, that being said, we do know right. that there was an Air Egypt uh, case, not a hijacking, but there was a co-pilot for Air Egypt in 1999 who purposefully destroyed yes. the flight, crashed it in the ocean. And there is Al-Qaeda documentation that seems to point that this was one of the particular uh, one of the particular influence for for uh, the 9-11 plot. Uh, Bin Laden is reportedly having essentially asked, why didn't he crash it in a building instead? Um, and and right. this was reported in some of uh, Al-Qaeda's propaganda as well. Now, there were quite, there is links between uh, the armed Islamist group in Algeria and Al-Qaeda. Uh, so so I, I, I think, you know, on the, on the balance of probability, uh, 
uh, it seems very likely that there was this kind of learning uh, exercise that took place. Now, is there a smoking gun? No, unfortunately not. But, you know, we often, you know, these documents come out a bit later on. Uh, so there's, there's definitely a, a hope that these links, which is what I call like the transmission aspect, uh, can be strengthened in, in my research. Uh, some cases are, are clear. You know, there's some cases where we can clearly see the influence and the links between one attack and another. And others, we have to essentially look at the balance of probability. Yeah, for what it's worth, uh, there's not always a smoking gun in intelligence circles either. So I understand uh, that. Uh, but I think you make a, you make a strong case. I, and I, I think that there is some validity to what you're saying. Now that this this book has been published, Yannick, and, and by the way, I'm going to include a link to it uh, in the in the podcast. So the title is How Terror Evolves, The Emergence and Spread of Terrorist Techniques. It's just come out. Is uh, published by Roman and Littlefield, which coincidentally is the publisher that published my first four books. Now that this is done, is are you going to continue along these lines, or where is your, your research agenda going to take you next? So I've been looking uh, a great deal at emerging technology. I just wrote uh, an article a couple months ago with a colleague of mine, uh, Emile Archambault, who's at the University of Durham, where we looked at how ISIS essentially weaponized drones and the role uh, of what we call ISIS drones program in its overall kind of propaganda strategy. So I've got this, this keen interest on emerging technology and the weaponization of essentially everyday consumer good. But where I think my research is going to focus on some more has to do with uh, the chapter on criminal innovation. So in my book, I also talk about how at the same time, you've got all this terrorist use uh, of hijacking. You also have a group of individuals that are hijacking for money. They're trying to extort airlines. Uh, they're trying to extort governments uh, for financial concessions. And one of the arguments I make is that these, these individuals who are hijacking for non-ideological uh, non, uh, reasons. Act, Ideological. Yeah. Yeah had a, a profound impact on how terrorists use hijacking afterwards. So I'm interested in continuing down that path and looking not only at hijacking, but what I call the crime terror innovation nexus. So how is it that hmm. criminal innovation are transported and adopted by terrorists? And, and I mean, we've seen this. So for example, I'm sure you're familiar with TATP. Uh, the, the explosive mm -hmm. referred to as a mother of Satan. So in the Netherlands, we just had uh, a, a group of individuals that were arrested manufacturing TATP. And it mm -hmm. raised a lot of alarms. Is, you know, is this a, a, a far right plot? Is this a jihadi plot? No. Turns out they were manufacturing the explos uh, th this explosive to rob ATMs. Uh, so this is kind of what I'm interested in. I'm interested in this, this nexus when it comes to tactic, when it comes to, to modus operandi between criminals and between terrorists, how do they learn from each other? How do they copy each other's methods of behavior? And surely you know, there's like also a clear link here to be done between the type of gruesome display of, of violence uh, done by the cartels and some of the techniques that are used by the cartels and techniques that are used by group mm -hmm. like ISIS, for example. It, it sounds like an absolute fascinating research program, uh, Yannick. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, more of your results in the years to come. And so, listen, I, I think we could talk about this for hours. Uh, unfortunately, podcasts that last hours don't seem to resonate very well. But I do want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Uh, we've known each other for, for quite some time now. And I, I wish you all the best in Leiden uh, in your career uh, in academe there. And uh, you've really shed light on a very fascinating aspect of looking at terrorism. And, and, you know, it's funny you talk about this criminal terrorism nexus, you call it. And, and I've been thinking a lot lately, as somebody who worked in counterterrorism for, for 15 years in intelligence for three decades, about whether we need to get to the point where we don't treat terrorism as separate from garden variety criminality. And I think there's probably some arguments in favor of that, of not giving the terrorists the attention that they want by simply saying, you're just a bunch of criminals and we're going to charge you with murder or attempted murder or whatever, as opposed to terrorism. But Yannick, this has been an absolute delight. 
to to hear what you, what you've been up to. And again, I wish you all the best. And, and thanks for taking the time to be on the podcast. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you for the invite. So that was my conversation with Yannick Villalepage. A uh, fascinating look, not just historically at hijackings, but what it means for terrorist innovation. What'd you think of our conversation? Love to hear what you, your feedback. You can reach me on email, borealisrisk at gmail.com or on Twitter at borealisaves. You can also find me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you like the content and want to listen to more, please go to my website, borealisthreatrisk.com. Hit the subscribe button. Provide your email address, you'll get a free daily digest to all the content, blogs, podcasts, media interviews, etc., etc., free of charge, first thing in the morning to your inbox. I'd love to hear what you think of the program. Please drop me a line. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe. <laughs>